Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is a progressive campaign agency that specialises in community organising. We work with not-for-profit and community-based organisations, trade unions, businesses and social democratic parties across the globe to develop campaign strategies, train engagement staff in leadership and power building and help you execute your campaign with data-driven tactics and actions. And in 2022, we will continue to work with folks that want to share their stories, inspire others, give hope and organise communities for change. To find out how you can partner with Dunn Street, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Today's episode is also brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Are you highly organised and love working in a fast-paced environment? Morris Blackburn, Australia's leading plaintiff law firm, is looking for an executive legal assistant to support a national leader on a 12-month fixed-term contract based here in Melbourne. This will include coordinating and supporting the leader with high-level administrative assistance, coordinating documents with strong attention to detail, building and managing relationships with key internal and external stakeholders and providing excellent client service. To simply apply, to simply apply, or have a, just to apply, simply go to morrisblackburn.com.au forward slash careers. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your number one centre-left politics and organising podcast out each Friday that dives into the progressive campaigns and the issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And over the next six weeks, we're going to do a state-by-state post-election analysis and recap. So we're going to cover all of the states and look at the results from the May 21st federal election. And we're going to do it with a whole bunch of experts that were actively involved in the campaigns on the ground. Um, And we're starting with today, Queensland, the Sunshine State, and we're going to have a chat to former party secretary, Evan Moorhead, who's going to talk to us about what happened in Queensland and why and where to from here. So check out today's episode, and every week we're going to drop another one as we move across the country to get a sense of, uh, I guess, a bit of a sort of a campaign analysis uh, for the party as we focus on holding government and uh, working towards 2025 in the next election. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Stitcher. And if you like the show, be sure to give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and, or Spotify. And when you're done, leave us a review on uh, Apple Podcasts, Podchaser or whatever pod thing you're using. And for all updates about the show, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. Okay, let's get to today's episode. Okay, we're taping this one on a cold Thursday afternoon on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. And to help me break down what is going to be the first of six state-by-state post-election debriefs, uh, I'm joined on the line from sunny Brisbane. So hopefully he can bring some warmth through the uh, the podcast. The former Queensland ALP party secretary, Evan Moorhead. How are you, Evan? Good, Stephen. How are you? Haven't seen you since uh, election night. What a wonderful night that was. It was a wonderful night. It's always better with Labor in government. Has it really sunk in for you? I mean, you've been around the party for a long, long time as well. Um, how are you sort of like, what I found is, you know, growing up in the 80s, the Hawke Keating years, it felt like that was the norm for us. Yeah. I mean, my, for, my you know, I turned 18 in 1996, right? So my, most of my <clears throat> formative time in the ALP was under the Howard government and everyone was so excited with you know, like it, like it sounded like this sort of new world when Kevin Rudd won in two thousand seven, and like a lot of Labor people, like a broken heart to have us out of government so quickly in twenty thirteen, and to have to put up with another nine years of libs is pretty soul destroying. Mm. Um, and particularly like um, we've had um, in Queensland a fairly torturous relationship with the federal government who were deliberately provocative in our direction, sort of took Queensland for granted, I think. So it's sort of been, um, you know, felt pretty harshly. So having a Labor government and hopefully the return of adult government in Australia is, you know, a pretty new dawn, I hope. I've been asking folks about how they celebrated election night. Um, obviously, you know, yourself and myself were a bit busy doing this ridiculous live telecast podcasting. So our minds were a little bit focused on a whole bunch of other things as well as the result. But I kind of remember walking out of the studio back to my apartment in the city with some, a couple of other people who kind of had a, some post-TV drinks. And I, I just felt very calm. 
I remember in 2007, I was a younger bloke then. I, to, I was so excited in 2007 when we won. Like I was probably in my late 20s, but I remember I got absolutely wanked drunk that night. <laughs> you know, I think I got to bed at like 7 a.m. I was so excited about that win. But this time, I just felt like there was a sense of calm about the win. I don't know whether I got older or if it was a different kind of oh, win. I reckon it's a bit of that. But also, I think the, the collective labour... Um, thinking is scarred by 2019, right? I think we are scarred by the sort of the view that a Morrison government would get re-elected in 2019 after being putting on a schmozzle for the pre- preceding three years with Turnbull. And I think this sort of view that we sort of, and I think probably fair analysis that we behaved a bit in the lead up to 2019, like we were, it was just a matter of time before we were back. Mm. And I think you can see that in our campaign this time, right? Like I think the entire campaign had this discipline of winning the election, not counting the victory first. So that by the time you got there, it was like deserved but not celebrated, I think. Like I think the whole Labor family was pretty disciplined, right? At, you know, not getting into bad behaviour of, you know, discussing what would happen after the election but just focusing on winning after 2019. And it meant that we sort of... I think, you know, the campaign strategy was able to manage expectations. So we didn't, you know, <clears throat> we didn't allow Morrison to run a negative campaign against us by creating these extraordinary expectations that we we're on track to win. It's true. The word that I draw from what you've just said there, disciplined, it was an incredibly disciplined campaign. And it just, we were, it just made it, it must have been frustrating for the Liberals to try and pin a negative on us, right? Because we just were so disciplined. Uh, my, my view of Morrison is that he was trying to replicate 2019, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, one, he didn't have any material to work with, right? It's easy and it won't be easy on Drell, but easy is a sort of the generic attack you go for when focus groups don't give you anything to fly with. Um, and I think the other bit, right, like in history, whenever someone's pulled off an election like 2019, they've always been smashed up the next time, right? Like 1993 for us. 2004 for John Howard. In Queensland, it was 2009 for the Bly government. Like, if you win that one election where people vote for you through gritted teeth, they don't give you a second chance, right? So I think um, a disciplined campaign and a a Morrison government, which really didn't bring more than politics, right? They sort of – I actually think they – I've got this view that they actually don't like governing, right? They actually quite liked the campaign and liked the politics of it and actually – didn't like the bit of actually getting on and running a government. I completely agree with that. I see my uh, my younger self student hack in the Morrison <laughs> government in which I loved campus elections, loved them, just going across the state, just winning elections left, right and centre. But then when you get in and you actually have to run student unions, that stuff bored the shit out of me. <laughs> I, uh, nothing to yeah, yeah. I couldn't wait to July again. Okay, we start planning elections again. This is fantastic. <laughs> but that's why no, I'm no, a politician. I've got this theory that, like, if you if you look at the election on day one when Morrison was doing his "I'm off to the governor" speech, you like almost like a sense of comfort and relief. Whereas I think our show, you know, like, is focused on governing, focused on the parliament, and had a few missteps in the first week because, unlike them, we didn't live for the politics, sort of politics for the hope of governing. That's another key word as well, something that was um, mentioned to me uh, from a uh, colleague. Our, our campaign was the only one that spoke of hope for the future, and I'm including the Greens in that as well. Um, yeah. Well, the Greens, are, um, the Greens are the best negative campaigners there are, right? Like they have this incredible way of doing negative material and making it look positive. Hmm. Like they're always campaigning in photos that look happy, that have, you know, pictures of the environment but they're always campaigning to stop something or fight something or prevent something, right? Like they are very clever at negative campaigning and making it look like something other than that, They're making it look non-political when it's actually ruthlessly political. It's like your mate that constantly makes backhanded compliments to you the whole time. Yeah, 100%, right? 100%. Doing poly politics differently by having negative material with nice photos. Exactly, and uh, and fluffy language. We'll talk about the greens in a moment. Do we, let's start. Let's 
the reason why I've got you on the show today is obviously is to do a bit more of a deep dive analysis of the state of Queensland and how things went on election night and the count uh, ever since then. Um, if we can give our uh, listeners at home a bit of a, a, I guess, a bit of an overview, and we're recording this one on the second of June, so the count hasn't completely finished. But at this moment, the t- the statewide two party preferred is fifty. 50- 4.5 to the coalition and 45.5 to Labor. Um, and that was a 3.9% swing to the ALP, um, which is, you know, that's a decent swing. If we then sort of break it down to the uh, the primary, uh, the coalition um, are on 39.9, so just a tad under 40% primary with a 3.8% swing against them. Labor's primary is at 27.6 with a 0.9% swing to them. The Greens are on 12.7% and a 2.4% swing to them. One Nation uh, had 1.5% shaved off their primary, takes them down to 7.4. United Palmer is uh, bang on five dollars. That that a dollar, uh, sorry, that 1.5% swing to them, and others uh, sits around 7.4. In terms of seat changes, the Coalition lost two seats, Labor lost one seat, the Greens picked up three, and other being Cata held. Broadly speaking, before we sort of start to dive into um, analysis, and I want to start with the positives, but just broadly speaking, look at those at those figures. Um, what's your top line kind of takeaways from that? So I think people um, can't underestimate that 2019 result. Like there's a good reason why Morrison stood up on election night and said, how good is Queensland? Where <clears throat> um, we got to a position in 2016 um, uh, where we knocked back a lot of those margins back to a point where a list of like lots of marginal seats in uh, at the end of 2016 heading into 2019 and those margins just blew out in 2019 like seats like Dawson having these you know margins of you know 10 percent and more is sort of extraordinary and these are seats which previously we thought we could win um I think what we saw is labor you know peg back a lot of those gains and we're sort of back to where we were in 2016 other than where we were in in sort of the urban Brisbane seats. I think um, Queensland's always been a home of high third party votes, right? We've always had a um, a history of large votes for Hanson, UAP, CADA. Um, uh, and I think um, what this election has seen is that continue, but more urban voters head to the Greens Um and sort of the Liberal heartland. Like we, we saw in most of those seats significant swings against the Libs, um, but not Labor being really unable to pick it up. I think the other bit of the 2019 result that people miss is that some of those margins in regional Queensland were really huge, but not on primaries. Um, a lot of those seats saw Labor voters go to Cata, Hanson and others, and the Libs winning with massive margins, but on 30-something percent primary. Like, you know, and it's sort of you know, not un- uncommon in a place where you're asking someone to vote for their prime minister through gritted teeth like they did in 2019. So I, th- I think we sort of started from that base and we've been- managed to make some- back some of that, like good swings in those regional seats, back to small margins. But disappointingly for Labor, just not enough to get into first place in enough of those seats. And unfortunately, there's sort of no prizes for second. Um, you know, it's always frustrating in Queensland when we end up with these seats um, as part and partly due to our geography where we can get within a couple of percent but often don't get across the line. Um, so I think that's the story across the state, um, you know, pegging back those big changes, making making up ground in those regional seats and back to marginal for some of those seats, but just disappointing to come back with only five seats. Let's talk about some of the positives from election night in Queensland. And I want to start with the seats that Labor held going into the count. Um, leaving aside uh, Terry Butler in um, in Griffith, the, we saw a um, mo- swings to Labor on the night in some of those marginal held seats uh, got that, uh, that Labor held, Blair, Lilly, um, Morton. Um, you know, Blair, Shane Newman had a 3.9% swing to him on his primary. Annika Wells in Lily had a 6% swing to her on her primary. Um, I think in, um, in Oxley, uh, Milton Dick had a strong swing to him as well. And Jim Chalmers uh, in Rankin. Um, why, what, what do you take away from that? 
So I think Queensland doesn't have the luxury of having safe Labor seats, unfortunately. Like even um, <clears throat> seats like Oxley and Rankin have, you know, in recent experience, elections in 2013 and 2016 where they really have come down to the wire. So I think you've got uh, a campaign-hardened team there who really have focused to win those seats. So, like, even though we only have five seats, none of them are, you know, safe in the same way that we have safe seats in New South Wales and Victoria. Um, I think you've seen um, a sort of a, an urban ring, like we've sort of done well in places in the urban fringe and urban ring in like Morton and Lily, um, <clears throat> where, you know, MPs and MPs with good local campaign structures as well. Like I've got to say amongst all of those, they're, they've all run, you know, strong campaigns from incumbency and have made a big difference, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm friends with Annika uh, Wells. She's been on the podcast a number of times, so I do pay attention to a lot of the work that she does. She seems to be working, well, I shouldn't say seem, I know she does. She works tirelessly and has had for three years. Is that the same that we can apply to a lot of the other guys that also um, got swing? Yeah, I, I think, you know, like Annika's 2019 election had a nail-biting finish where she got there in the end. Um, but she has been tireless. I mean, obviously she had the standard set by Wayne Swan before her, right? The same, you know, after losing in 1996, I've never seen someone campaign um, so obsessed as Wayne Swan has in Lily for all that time. Um, I suspect for Annika, she's probably also got Wayne Swan giving her free advice <laughs> all the time, which is always helpful too. Um, but, you know, like I think they did all the hard work and they sort of building profile as an incumbent. But I think the other one is they sort of, uh, didn't miss um, the uh, LNP candidate who tried to, you know, pull a bit of a swifty with his electoral enrolment. Like sometimes in campaigns, we, you know, some of our campaigns go a bit soft and don't, you know, go hard when we should. And that was a great example of a candidate who just wasn't fit to be in parliament. Annika's team did a great job of making sure everyone knew that. Then looking at the seats that you mentioned in the um, in the opening about the Liberal held seats that were way, way out after 2019 but have actually come back yeah. into um, um, a margin that is pop gettable in the 2025 campaign. Yeah, sure. um, what's the what are, what are the commonalities that we're seeing amongst those seats? Ge geographically, demographically, where are they? Why have they come back into being in contention? So Queensland has these regional, no, provincial city seats that go up the coast and at a state level, those seats are the backbone to our government, holding seats in Rockhampton, Mackay, Townsville, Cairns. Um, you know, that's how we hold our majority together and, and we've been able to defend that majority against the LNP for a long time. Um, this is the first Labor government um, f that I can think of that, you know, in, you know, post-war Labor government that has come to that has come to power without having a regional Queensland seat. Mm. You know, like Capricornia is was always a safe Labor seat and over time we've lost support there to third parties. Um, we've made those, you know, Flynn and Capricornia and Dawson are now back in the gettable range. Um, uh, Leichhardt's there as well. Um, and I think if we're going to build a long-term Labor constituency, we can't govern without those regional Queensland seats. Now, not only because the numbers just don't stack up eventually, it's also because having people who bring those perspectives into a caucus are really important. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Queenslanders are easily convinced that politicians don't look out for them and it becomes even harder to give them comfort in that regard when you're only sending people from Canberra. Like, Labor can't give up on those seats. Having those great results come in that put those seats back in marginal contention is a good first step. I'm pretty confident, though, that those seats are gettable with three years of good government. No, they are people who are, you know, vote Labor at a state level, you know, are open to voting for us at a federal level, but we've actually just got to put on a good show for them and actually deliver on the things they care about. You know, actually got to do, you know, roads and infrastructure and job creation in a way that gives them faith that we hear them and we look after them. Um, you know, we've had in the Queensland Labor crew, we've had Anthony Chisholm and Murray Watt and Nita Green in the Senate putting a lot of effort into those places and making sure they're heard. But nothing replaces having a, a Labor MP for Flynn or Capricornia or Dawson or Leichhardt. Can we talk about 
uh, Leichhardt and maybe even a bit of Longman in the pre-election build-up. We uh, when we did that monster episode, uh, we talked when we talked looked at Queensland. We looked at those two particular seats as potential gains for Labor. And looking at the results from election night, the needle really didn't move at all, um, both on primary and then in two-party preferred. And obviously, these were target seats for the national campaign. And I'm just wanting to get a sense: what do you think is the the reason that voters basically went back? and gave the same vote as they did for three years earlier. So I think the thing that misses in that, you know, the, some of the early analysis missed is the role of third parties in those plays. Like like Leichhardt's a really interesting seat, right? It is um, uh, Cairns, which unlike the other regional cities, is a very service economy, um, service sector eco- um, economy. Um and then, you know, those remote Indigenous communities across the Cape. Um, and I think um, I think the things we missed is that, you know, like Cairns itself behaves more like an urban seat than any other provincial city because it's, you know, major sectors are tourism, um, tourism, the, the university, reef and science research and those things. It's sort of, you know, people like to compare Cairns to a town for Laura Campton but Cairns isn't a resource city. It's actually a, you know, quite, um, you know, it's a service economy. It's like demographically closer to a Brisbane seat than it is to any regional seat. Um, and I think we missed the sort of the trend where um, the Greens did well there. And I think in Longman, um, uh, which is where I'm from, where I grew up, right, that part of the world, Longman's a really interesting seat where you can sort of draw a line across the middle at the Diagula Highway, the southern end being like key labour territory, um, you know, long history of delivering, you know, labour MPs at a state level, and an area beyond that which is this urban fringe, um, semi-rural environment, which often has people who are, you know, uh, you know, this, you know, often has their sort of high one nation voting, um, you know, uh, um, people on large acreage blocks and sort of uh, um, has been a great hunting ground for the One Nation over recent years. So I think um, you see in those seats that the beneficiaries of Morrison antagonism wasn't us. You know, in Leichhardt, it went to the Greens and others. In Longman, it's, you know, if you were angry and you wanted to vote against Scott Morrison and Longman, you didn't have to come to us. I mean, looking at the, uh, just stick with Longman for a moment. The the Liberal primary didn't move at all. There was no swing at all to speak of. Labor had a 2.4% swing against it on its primary. One Nation had a 5% swing against it on its primary. The Greens, 0.3, so not much at all. And they polled 7% of the entire primary vote. The United Australia had a 2% swing. Legalised cannabis had a 5.5% swing to it and animal justice had 1.9%. What's legalised cannabis? What's going on there? Well, as a proud Morrisfield High graduate, I might be able to explain that. uh, (laughs) No, no. um, It's, um, I think it's, you know, those third party votes, right? Like, they're not policy decisions. They are people who feel that no one in politics listens to them, right? It, you know, those third party votes are people who want the system to understand that they don't, they're not happy with how it's gone and they want to send them a message, right? So whether it's, you know, Palmer on vaccines or Hanson on race or legalised cannabis, it is people looking for an avenue to express their frustration at the major parties. And that's been the case in those urban fringe, semi-rural type places where they don't feel that they get the attention of a capital city and they don't have the same infrastructure of a provincial city and often felt forgotten, Um, you know, and I think they sort of take that out. I think, you know, in some of the research that I was involved in the lead up to the election, there were sort of two key demographics, right? There was um, engaged voters who had seen Scott Morrison and were determined that they're going to do what it takes to get rid of him. And there was a group of disengaged voters who didn't like Morrison but have incredibly low expectations of politicians and weren't convinced that getting rid of Morrison is necessarily going to make their life better. Mm. You know, so they didn't, you know, their expectations of politicians are so low that they don't necessarily have to participate in the choice for government. And I think that means that lots of people who were angry at Morrison um, didn't think that moving to Labor was the answer in their life. And I think that's where we've got this job of a Labor incumbent government is the only way that we can get those people. 
Let's turn now to um, some of the, the negatives from the night and obviously losing the seat of uh, Griffith and Terry Butler. Uh, also- yeah, losing Terry is a, you know, a huge loss to Queensland Labor. Future, you know, one of the future uh, uh, ministers of, of, of what was going to be a Labor government. Um, so, you know, a real impact there, but just also losing a, in a, a Labor, a seat that's been held by former prime, Labor prime ministers. Um, plus then losing two other seats to the Greens in the inner city. What's going on in inner city Brisbane? So I think, um, you know, although the, the sort of perceptions of Queensland is interstate, like, you know, Brisbane, the urban Brisbane is, you know, wealthy and educated and, you know, isn't the working class base that Griffith was 20 years ago. Um, you know, the seat of Griffith no longer is populated by meat workers and maritime workers. It's now, um, you know, people who work in the service economy. So I, I think there's sort of been a change in demographic over that time. Um, and I think there is just a challenge um, for us to rebuild labour to appeal to Queenslanders generally, but particularly in that it's based where we're, I think... My lesson out of the election is that there is a group of people who decided that the last 10 years of politics was pretty ordinary, right? From the moment that Abbott knocked off Turnbull in 2009 on climate through to now, we've seen politics is divisive and personal and bitter and decided that they weren't going to have enough, they weren't going to have any more of that and that putting an end to Scott Morrison was part of that. But I think there's a sense that you know, we sort of see ourselves in labour as victims of that culture war. But I think for a lot of people, we're seen as playing the game. Mm. So, you know, I think they, lots of Brisbaneites wanted to put an end to the nonsense of Morrison, but didn't necessarily have us as the answer. And we didn't have any teal candidates, which would have been fairly attractive to those urban middle-class voters that had popped up in, um, had popped up in Melbourne and Sydney. So, I, I think, you know, the tide was there and I think there is, you know, state labour, uh, state seats where the Greens have been able to establish a presence as well. Uh, so I think um, there's a trend, I think, that people have underestimated the influence of those urban voters in Brisbane for a long time. You know, like, I think if you look from afar, Queensland gets put together as like a state of coal mining and agriculture where it sort of misses the whole point in Brisbane. Look, it is interesting, certainly from being a, uh, uh, someone down south in, you know, you know, woke Victoria and the most progressive of progressive places in the world and what kind of garbage that we get thrown at us. You know, yeah, we lost. I mean, we're, we're in a knife fight with the Greens all the time, particularly in the city. It's funny when I do a lot of um, work with overseas Labor parties, particularly in the Europeans, because the relationship between social democratic and Labor parties in Europe with the Greens is far more constructive than it is here in Victoria. When I talk to them about the experiences, certainly here in Victoria, in what I would call, call ground zero, you know, there is an absolute hatred that exists between the, the, the you know, the apparatchiks of the two parties. Um, but... When we so when we lost the seat of the federal seat of Melbourne after Lindsay Tanner retired in two thousand and ten to Adam Band, you know that was an absolute that was that broke the the minds of so many of us just to give up that turf right in the heart of the city, but we've not given up one since, and I think what shocked a lot of us down here in Melbourne was seeing that the Greens jagged three in one hit in Brisbane. Where did that? We're we're all sitting around on election night going, where the hell did that come from? I think the challenge, right, is that the experience of the LNP for many people in Brisbane is this sort of outdated National Party Neanderthals that the state LNP keep putting up. So, you know, for a long time, the LNP in Queensland have been unable to pitch themselves to middle-class urban voters. And in a sense, they have vacated urban Brisbane at a state level to Labor, um, you know, um, <clears throat> where and sort of just tried to continually win elections by holding a rural base and then winning a couple of provincial city seats. Um, so I think, you know, like there's not a whole lot of, you know, moderate liberal options in Queensland, right? You either get a sort of a centre-left option with Labor or you get this like hard right option when the face of the Liberals here is Peter Dutton and others, right? So 
I think it means that there was this, I think what we missed is the huge drop in the LNP primary. You know, for a long time, there'd been a group of people who voted for Trevor Evans, the LNP MP, and were voting for the Greens at a state level, just because I think there isn't a centre-right option in Queensland. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, we didn't have this same trend when we had Malcolm Turnbull as a leader, right? Like, you know, um, they were vo those voters were voting for Malcolm Turnbull. I, I think that sort of, we underestimated, I think, what would happen when the Libs vacated the Liberal field. Yeah, why did they naturally then find a home in Labor as opposed to the Greens with their vote, I wonder? Well, I, I think, to be crude, like I think that... You know, their last experience of Labor in government federally was not a great one, right? Like some of the stuff that went on in 2007 to 2013 was pretty self-indulgent, right? Um, uh, and I think that, um, you know, that had that experience in 20, 2007 to 2013, then they had seen us trying to politically respond to culture wars for so long. So I just, you know... They recognised that Morrison was the problem but didn't see us as the answer. I, I do have faith, though. Like, I have faith that from government, Anthony Albanese can put on a competent show that is, you know, the adults in charge. Because that's been, like, the secret of success at a, at a state level, right? Like, the at a state level, we've been able to show through incumbency, you know, a sort of focus on the things that count. Um, you know, uh, we've been able to fend off... Um, scare campaigns against reform by actually getting on and doing it and showing people there's nothing to fear, uh, you know. And we've been able to do that from incumbency, uh, but at, federal, at, at a federal level, we haven't got that proof to show people that we're the answer to Morrison being ungovernable and unelectable. I mean, that's a really important um, point you raise there, uh, Evan, because the, uh, yeah, you know, the experience in um, in Queensland with the state government. Uh, Palaszczuk government ex experience here in Victoria with the Andrews government. Uh, we saw this in WA with the McGowan uh, government and hopefully we start to see this as well with the Melanousis government in South Australia is that when they got in, the things that they said they were going to do, they did and they did it well and then the voting public rewarded them with bigger margins in the next election. Um, what do we need to see from the Albanese government that then those people that didn't come with us into particularly in queensland that didn't come with us um last week will come with us in 2025. so I, th I think there's a governing task right which is to demonstrate that we're actually going to talk about them not about ourselves for the first time and you know we're going to put that morrison division behind us and i do think these guys are up for that right like we've actually got so much experience in that french front bench i think the other bit of it is we have to get the the cultural piece right which is like the further you live from the seat of power the more you distrust the politicians who come from there and i think in queensland it takes a lot to prove that um politicians are on our side and you know while you can have all the competent governing you've got to actually go and prove to people that you're on their side at a federal level, the federal LNP have done a much better job of appealing to regional Queensland in that way for a long time. Um, we've got to do a piece where we are on their side, understanding their issues and speaking on their behalf, even though we don't have MPs from that part of the world. That is mm. like, you know, you can be competent, but you've got to be trusted as well. And we've got to rebuild that trust for a group of people who don't think, you know, for a group of people who don't think that government listens to them and acts on their behalf. And I also think people just need to see shit getting done. Like yeah, there's lots of ways which, which we can communicate to a target audience about what we're achieving plans and accomplishments, but nothing beats. That's probably a bit of hyperbole, <laughs> probably not nothing beats, but it certainly is very effective. If you're driving around town, whether it be in regional Queensland or in regional Victoria or in urban parts of this, the country, if you see something getting built and you know that the government's doing that, the political tragics amongst us sort of sit, sit back and, you know, often presu presumed in our discussions are that people are waiting for political information, right? The vast majority of people, and this is sort of a testament to, of the Palaszczuk government, a style of 
getting on with the job without the fuss or the fights is actually a really attractive style of government, right? Like people don't want to have to worry about what Scott Morrison says on TV every day, right? They want to get up and say, all right, I'm going to get on with my life today. And I know that Anthony Albanese, is bu- he's busy doing his job so I can get on doing my job. And it's sort of been the hallmark of the Palaszczuk government, right? Anastasia has been um, very good at taking six years of political turmoil in Queensland and turning it into a style of government that got on with the job, wasn't in people's faces every day, gave people confidence that she was listening to them and on their side, but wasn't into the political theatrics all the time. And I think that's a really um, attractive style of government for most people, right? Absolutely. And I think that, you know, the big question, I didn't ask this question, but we've kind of sort of answered it in the way that we've sort of unpacked it is that why is Queensland Labor so goddamn successful at a state level and consistently as well, yet that we're not at a national level? And I guess the answer somewhere lies in between about observing what, what, what you guys are doing well at a state level and the, can, are there key lessons for Albo once he starts to sort of bed himself in? Oh, I think like Albo knows those lessons, right? Like Albo as an infrastructure minister was – had a really high profile in Queensland because he did a great job on the Bruce Highway and other things like that. Um, I think the lesson is there's one lesson of, you know, using incumbency to demonstrate competence and to deliver on the things that people care about. Um, I think there's another bit of style, which is how, you know, how we talk to people in a way that respects regional Queensland, acts on their behalf. Um, And I think the other thing... The other structural challenge for federal labour, and there is no solution to this, is just the geography of Queensland. What, um, why those regional Queensland seats will always be marginal um, is that the nature finding a hundred thousand voters in regional Queensland means you have to have a provincial city that votes labour, and all of the non-labour voting areas around it put together. So you've almost got this, um, you know, inbuilt handbrake. Um, on seats in regional Queensland. You know, the seat of Capricornia, you know, is built on Rockhampton, but then goes all the way up to the southern suburbs of Mackay and has cane fields and you know, all those bits between it. So that regional Queensland geography means that you're never going to have safe seats for Labor, but they're going to be forever marginal. Um, at a state level, you know, we get to hold all the safe bits of Rockhampton and come back with two seats in Rockhampton and three seats in Townsville and four seats in Cairns. But at a, at a federal level, we don't get, we don't get any prizes for second. Maybe it's a good uh, argument for some public policy about um, more um, population growth and investment uh, in service delivery jobs in those towns and start to actually grow those populations. Yeah. Well, and it has like, it was actually like a labor agenda in the Whitlam government, right? Like lots of government functions were moved to part, you know, parts of regional Queensland. It's actually one of the um, most unforgivable things that the Abbott government got away with, like literally cutting 800 tax office staff out of Townsville, like an extraordinary effort. And, you know, like, um, yeah, how, how they got away with that. I suppose they didn't get away with it and they lost to the Cedar Herbert at the next election. But um, I think there is a labour agenda for investing in regional Queensland. Um, and at a state level, you know, like people in regional Queensland trust labour governments to invest in their infrastructure, give them the same level of services as Brisbane, making sure they've got good hospitals and good schools. Um, you know, the people of regional Queensland are up for that discussion and want a labour government to do those things. Well, hopefully um, we see that in the next three years with uh, a new Albanese Labor government starting to invest in those communities and actually start to deliver for them. And then in 2025, all of those seats come tumbling back to Labor. Wow, that would be a great place to be. It would indeed. And uh, we can have you back on the telecast and you can join us and say, well, we've delivered. Well, it has been. um, When when I was State Secretary, I I said uh, in 2016, I said, oh, well, you know, I want to win Herbert, the seat of town. the research at the time said, look, I've had every state secretary sit in front of me for 20 years, say they're going to win Herbert, never pulled it off. But I, I think, you know, managed in Herbert in 2016 um, to actually make Townsville people angry enough that they vote against things. Townsville people are very good at getting very angry at government. So they you know, were prepared to vote against Tony Abbott and kick out Ewan Jones. It's good fun. It was uh, your Boothby for the Queensland experience. Yeah, pretty much. Um, 
Yeah, and actually, like, the field campaign being run by a Victorian who, you know, Jackson Hitchcock ran this, like, fantastic campaign, um, you know, where there's, you know, and particularly even targeting defence communities on the privatisation of defence housing. Like, it's a great example of campaigning in regional Queensland, um, you know, and people like Jackson did a great job. He's an elite field organiser, is uh, Jackson. Um, lovely name check. Well, uh, Evan, once again, thank you very much for your time coming on the show tonight, today, rather, I should say, um, and best of luck with uh, everything going up in uh, Queensland for the Labor Party. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for listening to Socially Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcast or Podchaser. And to get all the latest on Socially Democratic, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday. Thank you.